It's not just up to your ability to meet her needs. Although husbands have been called to take care of their wives, Dr. Tony Evans says you don't have to do it alone. Because you too have a provider to minister the grace where the grace is needed. This is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. People who think the idea of a husband leading his family sounds sexist will be surprised today as Dr. Evans helps us discover the link between leadership and servanthood. Let's join him. A man was on an airplane one time and he was sitting next to another gentleman. The other gentleman noticed that his wedding ring was on his right hand. He said, sir, are you married? He said, yes. He says, well, your wedding ring is on the wrong hand. He said, "Uh uh-uh, I married the wrong woman. (laughs) There was a guy who was crying over a tombstone at a cemetery. He was just wailing. Just wailing. Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? A man who was there visiting another lost relative said, sir, I'm so sorry. Is that that your wife? He said, no. Is that your mother? No. Is that your father? No. Why did you have to die? Well, who is it? My wife's first husband. (laughs) Many men are like Adam who said, it was the woman God that you gave me. And that's why I'm in this mess. Many a man has either said or felt like saying, I would have been much better off today if it were not for marrying you. We have tried to give a theological, not a sociological, rationale for the role of a husband. We have tried to, from Ephesians 5, dig out the wealth that is here, that a husband loves his wife by becoming her savior. He loves his wife by becoming her sanctifier. The day we conclude the husband's portion by saying a man loves his wife by becoming her satisfier. He says in verse 28, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Verse 29. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. You see the model? Christ to the church, a man to a woman. What does the man do? The same two things that Christ does to his church He nourishes it and cherishes it. Those are the two words. That is what every woman needs. Whether she knows it or not, that is what every woman wants. And that, therefore, is what every man ought to supply. Nourishing and cherishing. The word nourish means to feed in order to mature. Jesus provides all we need at salvation. Why? To mature us into disciples. When we're saved, when we got married to him, He didn't stop, he started. That's why you don't date to marry, you marry to date. See, in American culture, you date to marry, then you wonder what happened after we got married. Well, we stopped dating, that's what happened. In the Bible, you hardly sometimes even knew the person you married. But you married to date. In other words, it was a lifetime of getting to know and nourishing the other person. Jesus supplies our needs in order to help us to blossom. A man nourishes his wife in five ways. First of all, he nourishes his wife with his words of affirmation. He becomes her cheerleader. He applauds her. Instead of simply saying, thank you for dinner, nobody cooks potatoes like you. Now, thank you is one thing, but words of affirmation, nobody cooks potatoes like you. I would rather eat here at home with you than any fine restaurant in town. Five, the five-star can't compare with my six-star cook. <laughs> words of affirmation. You say, I don't know how to do that. You did it when you were dating. 
words of affirmation. You look beautiful today. Mm, mm, mm. A second way that you nourish is by going back to a quality time where you are have a listening time. Perhaps it's around the breakfast table. It can be made convenient to your schedule or lunch or dinner, but regularly saying, you know what I want to do? I just want to listen. I want to understand you. I want to hear you talk. Expert, that problem you were telling me about that I didn't have time to listen to yesterday, I'm going to situate myself here, and I want you to take all the time you need to fully understand what you're going through. That trauma at work that's got you all nervous, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I can give you advice about what you ought to do, but, but I want to understand how you feel. And that means the investment of time. A third way is through receiving of gifts. Receiving of gifts. And every gift doesn't have to be a diamond ring. Because the point of the gift is not the gift. The point of the gift is you were on my mind. You know, I was out of town on a business trip. I was there at the airport, and I, and I couldn't hardly focus on the plane. You were so much on my mind. And so what I went, and I got a little gift shop. I went to the gift shop, and I just happened to see this little card, and I just picked up this $1.55 card that simply says, just because I love you. And I just flipped, I just want to give you this. Now, that's, that's more valuable than a dime. Because you can give a dime and not think about the person for whom you purchased it. But when you gave thought to the gift, and it wasn't an official time to give it, <laughs> acts of service, doing the unexpected, washing the dishes when you don't know how to wash dishes, <laughs> surprise her this morning, if your wife makes up the bed every day, say, no, 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 you don't make up the bed today. That takes you two minutes. But all of a sudden, she became tremendously important because you did something that's normally her job and then physical touch that is non-sexual touch not a touch that says I'm going somewhere a touch that simply says I want to be close to you I want to be near you I want to hold your hand I want to put my arm around you I, I, I value being close that's nourishment. When it's ongoing, when it's regular, it's, it's routine maintenance. See, what you want to do is bring your marriage here to the car shop called the church. And you want to say, repair this marriage. It's falling apart. But when we look, the oil has never been changed. When we look, the tires have never been rotated. Nobody's ever put it on alignment. And you, you want to bring it to the big car shop so that we can we can do emergency surgery on your vehicle when if you just give it regular maintenance, it'll keep on running. That's what nourishment is all about. Then he says cherish. Cherish is to, 1 Peter 3 says, honor, treat as special. It says your wife is the weaker vessel. Understand your wife, she's the weaker vessel. Now that's been a misused verse. The only way a woman is weaker than a man is physically. She's not weaker intellectually, a lot more brilliant women uh, than, than men. Uh, you know, attitudinally, she's physically, she's built physically weaker. The word there, weaker, is not weaker in the sense of less than. The word there is weaker has to do with the way you handle highly valued material. In other words, fine china. You don't treat fine china like paper plates because it breaks easily. But it breaks easily and the reason you handle it carefully is because of how much you value it. It's a value issue. A man is to value his wife like fine china. The word cherish means to heat up or warm and it was used of a bird that would put its feathers over its young ones. It says you're special, top priority, number one. It affirms her dignity. It says there's nobody like you. You're in a class by yourself. She always feels like she's number one. Cherish, to hold as unique or special, to hoover your feathers over because they're yours. Men want to regularly change their wives. Some men make it a life's goal to change their wife. You've been married for five, she has not changed yet. 
Maybe your strategy ought to change. She's not going to change because you say change. She's going to change because it's in her best interest. You have plates that have not been washed for two or three days sitting in the sink. And now all of a sudden you're going to decide, I'm going to change this. So you start scrubbing on the plate. Scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and try to get the mess off the plate. But you're frustrated because it's hard work. It's an easy way to approach this. Soak them babies first. Run some hot water, put some soap powder in there, or dishwasher detergent, and just, excuse me, wrong thing. <laughs> Let them soak. Now, when they soak in, you're not really doing anything. You're just putting them in an environment of softening. And that water, that hot water with the, with the detergent gets in there and starts to loosen up stuff that was tough. Some of your wives are hard. Circumstances have made them hard. Life situations have made them hard. How they were raised have made them hard. Abuses they've seen have raised them hard. A domineering mother has made them hard. Maybe somebody has told them you can't trust men. That has made them hard. And then you on top of that, you've made them hard. And God's saying, why don't you soak it? Put it in the water and soak it with nourishing and cherishing and watch me loosen up the stuff. Because when it soaks long enough and hot enough, you wipe and don't scrub. The change becomes easier and more natural because the methodology is biblical and not secular. You've been listening to them boys on the corner talking about, well, I ain't going to have no woman tell me what to do. I'm going to go home and be man in my house, which is why they're on the corner. <laughs> You're going to be out there with them if you listen. That's not a biblical methodology for change. It's routine maintenance. That's the continuous things, nourishing, and then cherishing, holding as unique and special. And over time, a woman whose heart is at least open to the Lord will be softened over time. Sure, there are exceptions. Sure, there are women who, who are rebelling against God. Sure. But that is the exception for a Christian woman because God has created Christian women in such a way that they are pliable, moldable in the right environment. Dr. Evans will come back in a moment with more on how to create that proper environment. So stay with us. First, though, I wanted to remind you that today's lesson is the final part of Tony's brand new 14-message collection, Marriage Matters, dealing with our most requested topic ever. It covers practical issues like finances and communication, but it also explores the roots of the marriage covenant, deals with the spiritual side of sexuality, and lays the groundwork for a real family revival. We want you to start digging into this important material with your spouse, your kids, your Bible study, or small group. So we'd like to send you the seven CDs in Volume 2 of this collection. Just contact us today by phone or online, make any contribution, whatever you feel God leading you to give, and we'll send you a copy of Marriage Matters Volume 2 to show our appreciation. Get the ball rolling by visiting us at TonyEvans.org or call 1-800-800-3222 and let one of our staff members help you. Dr. Evans will come back with more of today's lesson right after this. Turning on the news or reading the headlines can leave us with a lot of questions. Why? What do I do? Where is God in all of this? It's these hard questions that bring us to our knees. Prayer is the God-given communication link between heaven and earth if we know how to pray. In Tony's upcoming book, Kingdom Prayer, he'll challenge you to tap into the power and authority you have in prayer and motivate you to utilize your access to our Heavenly Father. Pre-order your copy of Kingdom Prayer by Monday, and it'll come to you with some incredible free extras for you, your small group, or church, like free downloads of Tony's book, America, Turning a Nation to God, the classic Answers to Prayer by Andrew Murray, and more. Get details now at TonyEvans.org. If you believe in the power of prayer, don't make it an afterthought. Pre-order Kingdom Prayer today at TonyEvans.org. And so he comes and says in verses 30 and 31, Because we are members of his body, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
He says we are members of one another. The reason why you nourish and cherish is because of a theological principle that is staggering and it should blow your mind. He says the reason you do this is we are members of one another. Jesus has so connected himself with the church that you cannot talk about the church without talking about Jesus in the same breath. For him not to address the church means that whatever he's not giving to us, he is losing himself because he has become one with the church. So what does he say? He goes over the marriage vow. Verse 31. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother. Now this is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Please notice, men, it has nothing to say about a woman leaving her father and mother. See, we generally say, will you leave your father and mother as though it equally applies to both. Uh-uh. It says a man is to leave his father and mother. Now why? Because it's your job as the leader to establish something new. Which means you are to sever any ties that you have that conflicts or competes with this new relationship. You are to take the lead in creating a security scenario that she can respond to. A man leaves his father and mother. Then it says a man cleaves to his wife. The word cleave in the Greek and the Hebrew means to stick like glue, super glue this new relationship. He says that you are to cleave. Now what that means practically is no divorce. Malachi 2.14, God says, I hate divorce. And he's talking to men there for putting away their wives. He says, I will judge you for your divorce for an illegitimate reason. Why? Because in marriage you are to stick like glue. But then notice the last phrase. He says in the last phrase, and the two shall become one flesh. The man leaves, the man cleaves, but not till you get to the third line does the woman even come in. They. When the man leaves and sets up an environment of security and satisfaction, when the man cleaves so she knows she is attached like glue to this relationship, then you become one flesh. Or to put it another way, you can't become one flesh if you're fighting to become two flesh. Because you're working in the wrong direction. You've got to say as the head of your home, I'm leaving anything that will compete with our relationship and I'm going to stick with you. I am committed to you. There will be no divorce. The word will not come up in this house. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to change my strategy and instead of complaining, I'm going to start nourishing and cherishing and I'm going to become the greatest servant. And I, you will discover, he says, you will become, you won't start out this way, but you will become one flesh as needs are met. You're going to become one. But to take it the other way, to try to operate as two flesh, when you're supposed to be coming together as one flesh, means that there will be a breakdown in relationship and, oh, by the way, something else. God says, don't bother to pray about it. She wants a husband who's going to care for her, a husband who's going to nourish her, a husband who's going to cherish her. And you keep saying, no, I don't have time. I got a football game. I got to do this. I don't have time to listen. I don't have time to, to think about you. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. And then you come to church and you get on your knees and God is screaming from heaven, I don't have time. So the best way men to get your prayer answer is to answer her prayers. God will see you answer her prayers. He'll answer yours. Because we are members, he says, of one another. When you get married, you are creating something new. When you have a child, do you know what? You're creating something new, something that never existed before. When you and your husband have a child, you're creating something new. But the newness is the combination of one flesh. You only get a baby because there's been the coming together of two, making one in a joint way so that these two cells connect and create something totally brand new that never existed before in the form of a child. The same thing you do with a baby, God wants you to do with a relationship. Create something new. But that's hard when you've been used to being something old. In a country years ago, there was a custom that when you wanted to go get a wife, you brought cows with you. 
and you would trade the cows for a wife. The younger and the prettier the woman was, the more cows. There was a man who had two daughters, one young and voluptuous, the other older and haggardly looking. He heard that the rich man in town was coming to look at his daughters and was bringing cows with him. He thought to himself, whoa. And as the rich man came, he saw 10 cows. He gets the younger daughter, he calls her aside, come on, get ready. This man is bringing 10 cows. This is going to be great. He gets the younger daughter ready. The guy comes up and looks at both daughters. He says, I will take the older one. No pizzazz, no zing. I'll take her and I will give you 10 cows. He got married, went on their honeymoon, set up house, and about a month later, he got to see his daughter again. Oh, but what he saw was not what he gave away. He saw his daughter and had to look and say, whoa. She was magnificent. Had become more beautiful than the younger daughter. But how could this be? Simple. When she saw her value in the eyes of her husband, when he says, it don't matter how you look, you're worth 10 cows to me, she decided to become a 10-cow woman. She said, if he thinks of me as worth 10 cows, I'm going to start walking like a 10-cow woman. I'm going to start making myself look like a 10-cow woman. Some of you are here saying, I married the wrong woman, but you don't understand. If you treat the wrong woman like she the right woman, she'll become the right woman. But on the other hand, if you treat the right woman like she is the wrong woman, she'll become the wrong woman. So begin treating her like a thoroughbred and you won't wind up with an old nag. But there is one final question. How can I ever begin to meet all needs that this woman has? Simple. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. See, what you forgot is it's not just up to your ability to meet her needs. God says if you begin doing what you can do, I'll funnel from above that which you lack so you'll get the bonus necessary to provide what she needs because you too have a provider who is in heaven who will give you the grace to minister the grace where the grace is needed. Dr. Tony Evans talking today about ways husbands can spiritually and emotionally nourish their wives as he wraps up his brand new 14-part message collection called Marriage Matters. It's designed to help you keep the epidemic of family failure from infecting your home by following God's agenda for your marriage. Don't forget, today's your last chance to get all seven CDs in Volume 2 of this collection as our thank you gift for any contribution you can make to help us keep Tony's teaching on the station. But there's no more time to wait. Make your request today by calling us at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Or visit us at TonyEvans.org. When you do, be sure to pre-order your copy of Tony's upcoming book, Kingdom Prayer. Remember, if you do that by Monday, you'll get all those free extras we told you about earlier. So visit TonyEvans.org today. Get the details and make the arrangements before time runs out. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. All the electrical outlets in the world won't do you any good if you never plug your appliances in. On Monday, Tony will explain why that's the very problem that keeps so many Christians in the dark as he kicks off a series on prayer. I hope you'll be with us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you.